Now starting from people, here I am with my third recorded lecture. You'll notice it's level level 2 and the reason it is so is because it indeed was the second part but somehow due to scheduling mix up it ended up being the third. So let's dive into portal hypertension and beyond. An elevation in portal pressure is most commonly found in the presence of liver cirrhosis although it may be present in patients with extrahepatic portal vein occlusion, intrahepatic venoocclusive disease or occlusion of the main hepatic vein which is also known as the but Chiari syndrome. As portal hypertension per se produces no symptoms, it is usually diagnosed following presentation with decompensated rhotic liver disease and encephalopathy, ascites, or variceal bleeding. As early as the 17th century, it was realized that structural changes in the portal circulation could cause gastrointestinal bleeding. In 1902, Gilbert and Carnot introduced the term portal hypertension. To describe this condition. So what exactly does the portal system consist of? Simply it's a system of blood vessels that begins and ends in capillaries. On the left here is the capillary of the bowel and on the right is the liver capillary bed with the portal vein being the conduit. There is another human portal venous system the hypophysial portal system which transports hormones from the hypothalamus to the pituitary gland. The portal system, or more correctly, the hepatic portal system, is the venous system that returns blood from the digestive tract and spleen to the liver, where raw nutrients in the blood are processed before the blood returns to the heart. Now, a bit of anatomy. The portal vein normally receives as tributaries the superior mesenteric and the splenic veins, which basically form it. The right and the left gastric veins and uh, therefore blood from the lower end of the esophagus as well as the stomach and the superior pancreatic odontal veins in addition to the cystic vein or veins which join the right branch of the portal vein and the periumbilical veins are running along the ligamentum teres from the uh, which join the left branch. The ligamentum which is the obliterated remains of the Left umbilical vein is often not completely fibrosed even in adults in some 50% and it can be cannulated in the umbilicus. The five sites of portal systemic anastomosis are number one, the lower end of the esophagus. This is our area of interest today. And the upper end of the anal canal, the bare area of the liver, the periumbilical vein region and the retroperitoneal areas. In portal hypertension, around 80% of the blood uh, portal blood is uh, shunted into the collateral so that only 20% reaches the liver. However, this opening up of the collateral does not decrease the level of the hypertension. Here we see the basic portal systemic venous anatomy of gastric viruses. Sinister portal hypertension is the result of thrombosis of the splenic vein. So, if the splenic vein were thrombosed here, all the blood flow from the spleen would have to go and would be shunted through the short gastric veins and then it would open up these portal system now portal hypertension is defined as a pressure in the portal venous system that is at least five millimeters of mercury higher than the pressure in the inferior vena cava this increased pressure results from a functional obstruction to blood flow from any point in the portal system's origin uh, in this splanctic uh, bed through the hepatic veins uh, which is exit into the systemic circulation or from an increase in blood flow in the system. Understanding the pathophysiology of portal hypertension is important to understanding therapeutic management approaches such as pharmacological therapies, endoscopic therapies, and surgical and radiological shunting procedures. Although many advances have been made in this field, the complications of portal hypertension, uh, which include uh, gastrointestinal hemorrhage, number one, hepatic encephalopathy, retroretinal syndrome, and ascites continue to be the cause of significant morbidity and mortality. Portal hypertension remains one of the most serious sequelae of chronic liver disease. Portal hypertension may be caused by intrinsic liver disease, obstruction or structural changes that result in increased portal venous flow or increased hepatic resistance. Normally, vascular channels are smooth, but liver cirrhosis can cause them to become irregular and tortuous with accompanying increased resistance to flow. This resistance causes increased pressure, resulting in varices or dilations of the 
veins and tributaries. Pressure within the portal system is dependent upon both input from blood flow in the portal vein and the hepatic resistance to outflow. So normally, uh, the portal vein pressures range from between 1 to 4 millimeters of mercury higher than the hepatic vein free pressure and not more than 6 millimeters of mercury higher than the right atrial pressure. So pressures that exceed these limits define portal hypertension. Gastrointestinal hemorrhage may be the initial presenting symptom of patients with portal hypertension. Those patients with more advanced liver disease often present with ascites, hepatic encephalopathy, jaundice, coagulopathy, or spider angiomata. Patients who are hemodynamically stable may have warm skin, hyperdynamic pulses, and low systolic blood pressure. Additionally, splenomegaly and dilated abdominal wall veins are also indicative of portal hypertension. Splenomegaly can result in the sequestration of platelets from the systemic circulation and low platelet counts may be the earliest abnormal laboratory findings. Hepatomegaly is variable and dependent upon the cause and stage of the liver disease. Advanced stages would have small livers. Portal vein thrombosis may occur as a complication of portal hypertension but may also occur in cases of myeloproliferative or hypercoagulable disorders. We know that patients with cirrhosis and portal hypertension often develop complications from a variety of organ systems leading to a multiple organ failure. The combination of liver failure and portal hypertension results in a hyperdynamic circulatory state partly owing to the simultaneous planktonic and peripheral arterial vasodilation. Increases in circulatory vasodilators are believed to be due to portosystemic shunting and bacterial translocation leading to redistribution of the blood volume with central hypovolemia. Now, portal hypertension per se and increased splanking blood flow are mainly responsible for the development and perpetuation of the hyperdynamic circulation and the associated changes in the cardiovascular function with development of cirrhotic cardiomyopathy, autonomic dysfunction, and renal dysfunction as part of a cardio renal syndrome. The clinical manifestations of portal hypertension may include capnemedusi, splenomegaly, edema of the legs, and gynecomastia in males. Capit medusae is a network of dilated veins surrounding the umbilicus. It is caused by increased blood flow in the umbilical and periumbilical veins and is often accompanied by an audible venous hum over the umbilical vein. This is known as the Rubellier Baumgarten murmur. The gynecomastia is due to increased conversion of androstenedione from adrenal production to estrogen in the liver failure. Edema of the legs is seen in portal hypertension because of uh, alterations in the systemic hypodynamics that we discussed earlier now and the low albumin levels. Clinically, it may be difficult to detect portal hypertension until pressures are much higher. There are many causes of portal hypertension including etiologies above the liver, within the liver and below the liver. Suprahepatic abnormalities leading to portal hypertension include cardiac disease, uh, hepatic vein etiology, and inferior vena cava thrombosis or webs. Hepatic vein thrombosis or the Bert Chiari syndrome has multiple etiologies but is generally related to a hypercoagulable state and often treatable with anticoagulation. Liver fibrosis can result from suprahepatic disease and cirrhosis can also develop late in the disease course. Cirrhosis is the most common cause of portal hypertension and chronic viral hepatitis C is the most common cause of the cirrhosis. Alcohol-induced liver disease and cholestatic liver disease are other common causes of cirrhosis. Less common causes include uh, hemochromato uh, hemochromatosis, uh, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiencies, drug-induced liver disease and can, in countries like ours, hepatitis B. Portal hypertension is considered an advanced complication of once it has developed the term decompensated cirrhosis is used. Alterations of portal venous blood flow can also lead to portal hypertension. Arterial venous malformation of the splanchnic vasculature, splenomegaly and portal vein thrombosis are examples of infrahepatic causes of portal hypertension. Overall, these are not common conditions. Portal hypertension can be diagnosed in several ways. 
Clinical diagnosis can be made in the setting of end-stage liver disease and in the presence of ascites and or varices. Subclinical protohypertension is much more difficult to diagnose, but low platelet levels, a large portal vein and splenic enlargement on imaging studies are suggestive. Direct or indirect measurements of the portal vein may be accomplished using wedge hepatic vein pressure or splenic valve pressure, but these methods are relatively invasive. Imaging studies of patients with portal hypertension are helpful to make a diagnosis and to define portal venous anatomy. Duplex Doppler ultrasonography is a non-invasive, low-cost method of diagnosis that provides sophisticated information. It is often the initial procedure performed and provides specifics regarding the direction and velocity of blood flow in the portal vein. Findings of increased hepatic echogenicity, splenomegaly, portal vein dilation, robotic occlusion, collaterals, and gallbladder wall thickening are indicative of portal hypertension. MRI and CT are not particularly useful in making diagnosis but are capable of providing some of the same information. Portal pressure is uh, measurement is not generally indicated. It is most often performed in settings of therapeutic or hemodynamic research studies. Clinically, it is used to assess the efficacy of number one, the pharmacological agents or shunting procedures. Uh, most approaches to portal pressure measurement are relatively invasive with the exception of the newer endoscopic techniques. Uh, the most commonly used and preferred method for measuring the portal pressure is by indirectly calculating this pressure after occlusion of the hepatic vein, the wedge hepatic pressure. Now, this is an invasive pressure procedure and it's typically performed by interventional radiologists. Now, endoscopy is the standard diagnostic approach in patients with acute gastrointestinal hemorrhage after initial resuscitation. So, we do ABC, we give them saline, we start them on blood transfusion, vitamin K, and once resuscitated, we do an endoscopy. In most patients with cirrhosis, around 60 to 80%, bleeding is related to esophageal varices. So remember, some 20 to 40% may be bleeding from elsewhere, most commonly from a peptic ulcer. In addition to making a definitive diagnosis, endoscopic therapy itself may be indicated for the bleeding. So endoscopic examinations may require endotracheal intubation in patients who have significant alterations in the mental status as a result of the severe hepatic decompensation. Gastrointestinal endoscopy allows the visualization and biopsy of the mucosa of the upper GI tract, including the esophagus, stomach, and duodenum. When, if we use an enteroscope, it would allow us a visualization of at least 50% of the small intestine, including most of the jejunum and different degrees of the ileum. During an endoscopic procedure, a pharyngeal topical anesthetic is administered to help prevent the, prevent the patient from gagging. Uh, pain medications and a sedative may also be given prior to the procedure. The patient is placed in the left lateral position. The treatment of Portal hypertension is aimed at prevention of complications. So we are always looking about talking about complications. The main goal of therapy is to decrease portal. This is generally difficult to achieve and to adequately maintain and due to many factors, most of them patient factors. Ascites frequently develops in patients with chronic liver disease. Clinically, patients may be asymptomatic or may have a variety of complaints, including early satiety an increase in the abdominal girth or respiratory distress depending upon the amount of fluid accumulation in the abdomen. Patients with ascites often have abdominal distension, tympani of the top, uh, bulging in the flax, the puddle sign, they would have a fluid wave or shell thrill, shifting littleness on a physical examination. The accumulation of fluid as ascites is the most common complication of the cirrhosis. This uh, is occurring in about 50% of patients with 10, within 10 years of the diagnosis of cirrhosis. It's a prognostic sign with uh, one year and five years survival rates of 85% and 56% respectively. The most acceptable theory for ascites formation is uh, peripheral arterial vasodilation leading to underfilling of the circulatory volume. This triggers the baroreceptor receptor mediated activation of the renin and renin angiotensin aldosterone system sympathetic nervous system and the non-osmotic release of vasopressin to restore uh, circulatory integrity. The result is an air with sodium and water retention identified as a pre state. This condition will evolve into overt fluid retention and ascites as the liver disease progresses.
The most important aspect in treating hepatitis is to restrict sodium to less than 2 grams per day. More restrictive regimens are difficult to accomplish in the outpatient setting. Water restriction is generally not necessary unless patients develop hyponatremia. In this setting, fluid restriction to less than 1.5 liters per day is generally adequate. Diuretic therapy to reduce um, sodium retention by the kidneys is generally required. Uh, this is achieved through blocking the effects of the salt regulatory hormone aldosterone and uh, loop diuretic functions at the ascending limb of the loop of the Henle. So, generally, a combination of a spironolactone or other potassium sparing diuretic along with a loop diuretic is required for complete diuresis. Patients need to be monitored closely for side effects, uh, which include uh, hyponatremia, hyperkalemia, hypokalemia, dehydration hypertension and azotemia large volume paracentesis may be, still be required in patients with difficult to control ascites or in patients who do not tolerate diuretic therapy abdominal paracentesis may be used to therapeutically remove ascites and is useful in relieving respiratory difficulties acute oliguria or pain the paracentesis is performed at the bedside after sterilization of the abdominal wall a local anesthetic is administered a sterile needle is inserted into the left ab abdomen and the cytic fluid aspirated. Infusion of intravenous albumin after large volume which is greater than 5 liters per synthesis is preferred. Varices are varicose veins visible on endoscopy and upper GI series or other imaging studies that occur in the esophagus or stomach as a result of portal hypertension. The pressure within these irregular vessels is great and they have the potential to rupture. Acute bleeding from varices or non varicile sites in patients with portal hypertension requires prompt and appropriate measures to control bleeding and to prevent recurrent episodes. Therapy is aimed at the prevention of recurrent episodes of variceal bleeding by lowering portal pressure and eliminating the varices. Here we can see an endoscopic view of the esophageal varices. Um, this one is the esophageal varices and these are the gastric varices. A whale bar, red whale sign or a whale sign is an endoscopic sign suggestive of a recent hemorrhage or propensity to bleed seen in individuals with esophageal varices. The mark has the appearance of a longitudinal red streak. Here we can see this one and hit this one here. And uh, it derives its uh, name from the similarity to two short dry whales. Here we can see uphill esophageal varices. This barium swallow demonstrates uh, multiple serpiginous filling defects, primarily involving the lower one third of the esophagus, with striking prominence around the gastroesophageal junction. The patient had cirrhosis secondary to alcohol abuse. Here we can see the uh, huge amount of varices. This coronal uh, MIP, this is the maximum intensity projection, CECT, it's showing a dilated left gastric vein, this one here, and uh, which is serving as an afferent for the multiple uh, parasophageal uh, varices, these ones here, okay. Um, medical management of bleeding esophageal varices or gastric varices may be instituted once the cause of the hemorrhage is documented to be origin. Drug treatment is aimed at reducing portal inflow or collaterals or intrahepatic resistance. When the hepatic venous pressure gradient is below 12 meter, minutes of mercury, the danger of very still bleeding is relatively, relatively low. Use of non-selective beta blockers has been shown to decrease portal pressures, but the side effects of the drugs are sometimes prohibitive. Uh, Propranol is a non-selective beta blocker that has been extensively studied and is effective in decreasing portal pressures. It decreases the risk of variceal bleeding both as a primary prophylaxis and after an initial bleeding episode. The do dose, dose needs to be titrated uh, to decrease the resting heart rate by 25%. Uh, unfortunately, in patients with cirrhosis and no varices, the side effects outweigh the benefits of beta blockers. And therefore, these medications should not be used for the prevention of variceal development. Combination pharmacotherapy with isosorbid, mononitrate and beta blockers for prevention of variceal re-bleed have almost equal results to 
endoscopic bear ligation which we'll be addressing soon there are no other medical therapies that can be recommended to prevent uh, pericial bleeding use of vasopressin in the acutely bleeding a patient is effective and works by decreasing splanchnic blood flow vasopressin therapy should be instituted in an intensive care unit uh, through a central venous access line the use of this drug is associated with side effects of vessel constriction and other vascular beds including cardiac vessels uh, vasopressin should be administered with sublingual nitroglycerin Metastatin is currently the preferred drug for acute variceal bleeding. It also acts as a vasoconstrictor but works only on the splanchnic bed and therefore has fewer side effects. It is given as an intravenous bolus at 50 micrograms followed by a constant infusion of 50 micrograms per hour. Per hour. The short term, um, around 7 days administration of antibiotics to patients with cirrhosis and acute variceal hemorrhage is the standard of practice. In these patients, antibiotics have been shown to reduce the rate of free bleeding and increase overall survival. Antibiotics should be administered if, irrespective of the presence of ascites where we fear uh, spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. It is preferred to select an antibiotic to target gram-negative bacteria. Endoscopy plays a critical role in the diagnosis and treatment of gastrointestinal hemorrhage. Um, treatment options include sclerotherapy, banning of esophageal varices, and balloon tamponade to control bleeding. Acute variceal hemorrhage is ideally managed by variceal ligation with elastic rings, commonly banding. It's called banding. Endoscopic band ligation or EBL as the name suggests is performed endoscopically and is safe and effective. This technique employs the use of small elastic rings that are placed over a suction varix. When a patient with a suspected acute variceal hemorrhage is admitted to the hospital, treatment should be Im immediately initiated with a somatostatin analog. Then upper endoscopy with variceal ligation should be attempted within 12 hours. Now, banding has fewer side effects and complications than splenotherapy and is equally effective. After the initial banding session, subsequent banding sessions are scheduled with the intent to completely obliterate the varices. This takes around uh, two to four sessions. The use of sclerotherapy or injection of a sclerosing agent directly into and around the varices is an older technique. It consists of injection, injecting 1 to 10 ml of uh, sclerosing agent such as uh, sodium morphoerate, uh, sodium tetradecal, sulfate, ethanolamine or absolute alcohol into the varix at the beginning uh, at the gastroesophageal junction and circumferentially into all the columns. There is considerable variation in the type and volume of the agent used as well as the site of injection. Um, comparison studies of various techniques and solutions have not shown any significant advantage over one method. Uh, in the setting of the acute variceal hemorrhage, sclerotherapy should be reserved for patients whom band ligation is uh, not technically feasible. After the initial sclerotherapy session, subsequent sessions are scheduled with the intent to completely obliterate the varicose veins, the varicosities, and this would take around uh, a little bit more four to five sessions. The common side effects include a tachycardia, chest pain, fever, and ulceration at the site of the injection. Balloon tamponade is useful to control variceal bleeding through compression. One of the three commercially available tubes is used to tamponade the bleeding esophageal or gastric varices. These are useful when medical management has not been successful and endoscopic management has failed or is unavailable or there is massive bleeding. Although quite effective as a temporary measure, there is a high risk of complications, especially aspiration. Only experienced phys physicians should perform the tube placement and the patient should be carefully and continuously monitored. Here the tube on the right with the three ports is the sex taken blackboard tube. Okay, this one. And the left one is uh, with the four ports is the Minnesota tube. The fourth port is for the yes, esophageal aspiration. After insertion of the gastric, uh, after insertion the gastric balloons is, is inflated first, and then the tube is pulled up to engage the gastroesophageal junction. The esophageal tube can be inflated afterwards, but it is rarely required. So here is the gastric balloon in uh, engaging the GE junction. 
These tubes can control about 60 to 90 percent of breeds but need to be removed within 24 hours and should be considered breeding therapy till the institution of either tips or surgery. Coming to tips, uh, tips shunting is a or fast jugular intrahepatic portosystemic shunting is a logical procedure that has become very popular as an alternative method of controlling acute bleeding, especially if gastric paresis are present. It is also indicated in patients who have recurrent bleeding despite medical or endoscopic management. Contraindications to TIPS placement include severe, severe liver disease, uh, dysfunction, renal failure, and heart failure. The procedure itself requires a high level of expertise and is performed under fluoroscopic guidance using intravenous sedation. First, access to the hepatic vein is obtained through the right internal jugular vein. A needle is passed through the liver barrier of gyma into the portal vein, followed by dilation of the tract and subsequent placement of a metal or PTFE covered stent. The stent is dilated to achieve a portal to hepatic vein gradient of less than 10 mm. Success is over 90% in experienced hands. The long term utility of the stent is limited uh, by the occlusion, high occlusion rate from thrombosis or stenosis. The main side effect is worsening hepatic encephalopathy, which can be severe in a minority of patients. The patency of the stent can be checked by Doppler ultrasound, and a stenosed stent can generally be revised. Now we come to surgical stents. These provide better control at rebleeding when compared to the combination therapy or beta blocker and endoscopic band ligation. However, these shunts are associated with a higher incidence of hepatic encephalopathy and should be reserved for child class A patients with recurrent bleeding despite adequate combination therapy. The aim of surgical shunting in portal hypertension is threefold. Number one, we want to reduce the portal venous pressure. Number two, we want to maintain the hepatic and portal blood flow that's important. And two, try to reduce or not completely the hepatic encephalopathy. Currently, there are no known procedures that reliably and consistently fulfill all of these criteria. The operative mortality in shunting procedures is about 5% patients who are good risks and about 50% in those who are poor surgical risk. Surgical shunts are often very effective in patients who have mild liver disease but have severe portal hypertension, such as in the case of acute hepatic vein occlusion day, but here is in. Total or non-selective portal systemic shunts include any shunt larger than 10 mm in diameter between the portal vein or one of its main branches and, or, and the inferior vena cava or one of its tributaries. Partial portal systemic shunts reduce the size of the anastomosis of a side-to-side -side shunt to 8 mm in diameter and in, in order to preserve the uh, portal pressures and portal flow. Uh, portal pressure is reduced to around uh, less than 10 12 millimeters of mercury, and the portal flow is maintained in 80 percent of these patients. Selective shunts provide selective decompensation and compression of the gastroesophageal varices to control bleeding while at the same time maintaining a portal hypertension to maintain portal flow to the liver. So, this is a non selective end to side portal cable shunt. Um, this is a side to side portal cable shunt. And, uh, we come to a central splenorenal shunt again. This is a non selective central splenorenal shunt, and this is an interpositional H shunt. Okay, and then the mesocable C shunt. These are just examples of the, the different shunts that we have. Now, this is the distal splenorenal or varin shunt, and the distal splenorenal shunt. Uh, decompresses the gastroesophageal varices uh, through the short gastric veins, the spleen, and the splenic vein, the left renal vein. So we've tied off these veins here. These are the gastric veins, and then we've taken the splenic vein down here and anastomosis to the liver. So the varices from the esophagus here, the blood flows through the short gastric veins into the portal vein and into the Now, this is a coronary cable shunt. Again, it's a uh, selective shunt. It's decompressing the whole of the esophagus, as, as you can see this bit. And the management of uh, recurrent variceal bleeds secondary to splenic or protruvian thrombosis. The treatment is by splenectomy and gastroesophageal devascularization, in which the blood supply to the greater and the lesser curvature of the stomach and lower esophagus is divided. 
Splenic vein thrombosis may be seen secondary to chronic uh, pancreatitis and portal vein thrombosis is a common late complication of liver cirrhosis. So here is a comparison of the different sorts of channels. As you can see, we've got the total portal systemic channels, the partial portal systemic channels, and the selective channels. So in their effectiveness, uh, we can see that each and uh, has some advantages and some disadvantages so um, ideally we would be looking at uh, those chunks that are selective chunks which are better in keeping the liver intact but selective chunks usually have a problem of a greater post -mor morbidity and mortality because of an extensive dissection now um, we come to the proper thing the liver transplantation this is the only effective treatment for end stage liver disease and this option offers excellent patient survival and rehabilitation but the problem is uh, the challenges are like there's a scarcity of human cadaver donors uh, there is the fear of rejection and the limited financial resources of most people it's an expensive procedure Liver transplantation is a long and complex surgery that involves the removal and the replacement of the body's uh, largest body organ, a solid body organ. It requires surgical expertise in brewery and vascular reconstruction. So, very still bleeding alone is not an indication for transplantation. However, refractory bleeding can elevate the listing status of patients awaiting a liver transplant. In most patients, it's impractical to use uh, liver transplantation to treat portal hypertension because these individuals can be managed successfully with lesser methods. Therefore, the use of transplantation must be based on appropriate patient selection. So, for patients with a child class A disease, front surgery is recommended if you need surgery. For patients with child class B disease, front surgery or a TIPS is an appropriate procedure. And for people with child C class disease, TIPS or OLT or orthotopical liver transplant is recommended. So, to sum up, the surgical interventions that we have include decompressive shunts, devascularization procedures, and OLT, which is orthotopic liver transplant. Um, any questions? So, to obtain full benefit from these recorded lectures, please both watch and listen to them. Thank you very much for listening in. I have enjoyed this lecture and uh, my hope is that you too did. Any questions are welcome. Allah Hafiz and stay safe.